and now the host of Entertainment Now, Gail Scott Key. In 2010, my guest founded the Power of Peace Project using the experience he gained resolving conflict in some of the most dangerous areas in the world. He's applied his principles to bringing about change in prisons, schools, courts, and faith-based communities. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Gail Scott Key, your host on my Gail Scott Key Entertainment Now show. This isn't entertainment per se, it's education. And Kit Cummings, he's an award-winning author, teacher, consultant, and joins me courtesy of Elite Public Image. Kit, I have to thank our dear mutual friend, Richard Mungia, for connecting us as your story is incredible, we have a lot to cover in this half hour, so I do not want to delay because I was salivating when I saw you both on the video together. And like I said, Richard, eat your heart out. We got a little mini tour before you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for coming on my show. I'm extremely proud of you. And you were talking about something that is so prevalent. It's been going on for ages. And, and let me just do this, if you don't mind. First of all, violence is among the leading causes of death in the, U in the U.S. amongst the youth. Did right. you all hear that? Kit is going to enlighten us in this half hour. Kit, I want to turn it over to you because you're going to give us this level of education that I don't believe a lot of people are understanding, or it's maybe being pushed over to the side because we've got so much going on. Goodness knows with Ukraine war, and other things that are just taking precedence as should as they should be. But you have been in over 100 pr prisons, jails. You have unified a lot of these gang members together in ways that so many have fallen short. You've also been uh, recognized through, believe it or not, everybody who I share this story with. You're a recipient of the prestigious Martin Luther King Jr. Living the Dream Award. Every time someone says to me, how am I doing? They say, I'm living the dream. You have been a recipient of this award. Tell me, take me to where this became such a poignant act of helping the youth and getting involved. And in, in, we want to hear your story and where this has led you. Wow. And first of all, thank you for having me. And I, I say thank you to Rich as well. It's a beautiful connection. Um, I love I love it. Great energy. And I appreciate you having me on. Um, it, it's not something you wake up or grow up saying, you know, I'm going to work with gangsters for a living. You know what I'm saying? Or you don't go to school for that. You don't. I mean, it's just it. It was just the perfect storm that developed it. I was I was out of hand when I was young. I mean, I was not a, I wasn't a religious kid, you know, and, and I just was wild. Um, good athlete, good student, got along with people real well, could fit in, but I had this crazy life and it was drug and alcohol and runs through my, my family line and, uh, took my father, uh, when I was in college. And so I was really heading down that road mm -hmm. and a lot of things that come with it. And, uh, and then I had, you know, this spiritual awakening in my life at 25, I was just trying to get sober mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, was just tired. And I was in the entertainment business. I'd gotten into the music business. And it was like, man, the party and just getting from high school to college and then from college into that business, it was just, it was out of control. And so I was burnt out at age 25 and I met a guy and he changed my life. He studied the Bible with me and I'd never, I'd never seen it. <laughs> you know, I mean, we didn't go to church. Parents tried to raise me right. I've made horrible choices. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, it's just, I, I fall in love easy and I love hard. And that's what I did. <laughs> it's like it was for real for me, man. And I just had to tell the whole world. And so I've only got one speed and, and it's all out. That we, if that's either a good thing or a bad thing, I don't have a, a middle ground. You know, it's either I'm going to save the world or tear some stuff up. And he built me that way. And so I did, man, I just, I, I found out I could preach. I never knew it. I'd never done it, you know. Um, and something woke up in me when I got in front of the first congregation and I just, it was, I had found my calling in life and, and it was amazing. And I got married, had a couple of kids and served in the, in the ministry leading churches from 25 to 40 and really learned how to preach and learned how to build a ministry and learned so many valuable things. Mm -hmm. And then the storms came and all of this is setting me up now. I mean, I believe God uses our choices 
and he uses whatever we give him. You give him a mess, he'll use it. <laughs> you know, yeah. give it, give him our best, he'll use that too. And so, you know, he's he's doing his thing. And I just fell. I mean, I was burned out again at the age of 40. Um, I was just tired. Man, that ministry life, the bubble, I mean, they treated us like rock stars. And it got heavy, you know, and I'd been messing around, you know, I was trying, how, how close to the line can you get without getting burned? Mm. And so I started playing that little game and, and then I was in a, I was in a bad place. And so I resigned. I was like, I got to go. Mm. And I walked into a whirlwind and I just had a, it was a reckless year, man. I mean, I was going down hard because, you know, my fall from grace was public. And, you know, you're not paranoid if everybody really is talking about you <laughs> in Atlanta. <laughs> it was a story. And I don't have shame now. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm not living in regret. That's why I can laugh. But, you know, it's my story. Um, but anyway, you know, I fell hard and I just went out there on my own. And I shook my fist at God and I, I told him, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And I went and started crashing cars. That's what I do. And, uh, and so I was at the bottom, man. I was like, I don't even, I don't even want to be, I don't care if I'm here anymore, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the magic happened <laughs> and it just, you know, you have that moment of clarity and, um, and I just made a decision December 27, 2005, had my last drink. So it's been what, almost 17 years, which is a big deal in my family <laughs> line. So, you know, so, and I'm wide open about that because I wanted to help people if possible. But the problem was um, I lost my dream. And so now I'm sober and I'm miserable because I can't preach. You know, I, I met the love of my life and was remarried. And uh, but I'm just like hustling, doing these jobs that I hate. And, and I'm dying inside because, man, I know my prayer. What do you do when your dreams all show up and then you squander them? And that's what I did. I was prodigal son. And so um, I prayed a prayer, and then this will kind of get me back to you. <laughs> I go around and around when I answer a question now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I prayed a prayer. It changed my life. I said, if you ever let me preach the word again, mm -hmm. I'll go to the, the ones nobody wants to preach to. And I named them. I said, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the stranger, and the prisoner. And I meant it. And I don't even know what possessed me to pray, but I did. And I thought, man, you just let me preach again. I'll go wherever you want me to go. And it took three years for that prayer to be answered. And it's not that he waited three years. It's like I had to be prepared for three years. Mm -hmm. And then he brought a kid into my life, an MS-13 leader, gang leader. I knew him when he was a kid, fighting for his life, literally a death penalty case. And God just threw me in the deep end. And it's been just this wild ride ever since. I'm so moved by you. And I wanna thank you for your transparency. Because there is no, there's no room for shame because we all have it, right? If we're going to be, if we're going to be that way. So I hold you up, Kit. And I thank you. I thank you for also being so daring to ask God specifically to move you in a way to help because there, there is a lot of help that is needed. And sometimes, you know, like you said, when you get that knock, we're just like, um, you want to get that door? <laughs> Cause you don't expect it. Cause I've been in that, sh I've been in those shoes. So I applaud you and I thank you. And I want to thank you because there is a lot, as I said, that we have to cover for anybody, um, who is looking at, at faith and looking at stories. As I said, Kit Cummings is here. He's award-winning author, teacher, consultant, and we are going to be talking about where he has been led. Let's talk about this. So, I've understood amongst the awards, amongst you traveling out, you have, uh, as I mentioned, you have visited these prisons and these jails, also with the gangs. There's a special language, there's a special code, and it breaks my heart as I'm doing some research. They're saying the most common age that youth gangs um, join, join gangs are from 12 to 15, but it's actually younger. We're talking mm -hmm. five. So can you tell me when you finally got the calling, take us on the journey. Where did those steps lead you first? And who were the youths that you were presenting this discussion to? And how were you received when you were talking to them? Yeah, um, it was, you know, I, I started working with this kid and it was for two years. So, I mean, he was my audience for two years, following him around when they would ship him around and, and on this huge case. Mm -hmm. And he had a uh, green light on him from his own gang. I mean, so he was, I mean, there was cop car in my cul-de-sac because they threatened me. I mean, we're in the middle of this wild. And so then I get invited to 
what turns out to be the worst, most dangerous prison in the state of Georgia. And Georgia is a lock them down state. Um, but I didn't know any better because I've been working with this killer anyway. And I know who he was. That was the secret. I knew who he was when he was 12 before they got in. And so grown up, they told me he was a, a dangerous killer. I'm like, nah, I know him. And that's how God started me. If that, I mean, maybe that's the way he got me in. It's not like I was all, I'm ready to go to prison now. Mm -hmm. And so, but man, when I went through the, the gates of that prison, it's called Hayes, it's notorious in the state of Georgia gang, more active gang members than any other prison. I was excited. I mean, it's because I'd seen miracles with Luis. And so I walked in there ready to make some friends. And that is what I do Maybe it's the thing I do the best is I make friends and uh, it's my favorite thing to do. And I don't know, I love to do it. So I started making friends with some dangerous dudes <laughs> and it just, it changed me. And we got a group of them together and uh, we had a crip and a blood and a gangster disciple and a Latin King and a Muslim brother. And we were all in a group and I was going to, to the prison every week, twice a week. And I would get this little group and we started dreaming that maybe we could bring peace to this prison. It was a crazy dream. And so we jumped it off on, on Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, 2011. And I've been following that man after Jesus, it's Martin. And uh, that, that has radically changed. I've been following him for 35 years um, and actually knows family. And I mean, I'm, I'm very, very, I love the Kings. And so anyway, magic happened. And we started just expanding this movement and peace came to Hayes and it won institution of the year that year. And they, and this is as real as it gets, they saved me. Now, cause this is important. I was not going to go to church, Gail. <laughs> I wasn't going back to preach in the churches. There was too much shame, judgment, gossip, slander. I was like, no. And I was still trying to trust him. <laughs> And mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to go into prisons because I had all these demons that needed them. You know, I say that these, this shame and this pain and this guilt. Um, and I earned it, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it needed to come out. They became my safe place. Imagine that. God put me in a very safe place and it was in a maximum security prison in the middle of a gang war with a bunch of gangsters. And they were the ones, because I would talk about my pain and they would cheer and I would tell them about my worst moves and they would laugh and they just we bonded and I needed them and so they were there for me and nobody really understands that I didn't start this program to go and help some bad guys they were the ones that God used to, to give me my voice back and figure out who I really am I didn't know who I was till I met them because this is real as it gets behind that wire and so really this, this crazy tour, which has taken me to 40 states and four continents and prisons in Mexico and Honduras and South Africa and Ukraine and death row and just this wild journey, it's, a, it's me. <laughs> it's like a IOU tour. It's like I owe them, man. And so every time I get to go in a new prison, get in front of a bunch of brothers, I say, thank you. And they're like, for what? And I'm like, man, you saved me. And they go, we don't even know you, dude. And I'm like, no, but I know you. Mm -hmm. Boom, I'm made again. I'm like a made man. And so it's my favorite place to be besides with my family. So anyway, I get kind of, I get kind of. I ready. love that. You know something? What I love is, um, you know, I, I don't know if you remember Wyndham Shaw from. Oh, of course, beautiful brother. Yeah. That's how I was introduced in the church. And he said, if you want to go to a church where there's no sinners, good luck. That's where I stayed. I stayed. So I hear you. And plus being relatable, people who are suffering need someone who can say, let me put the shame here. Mm. Let me hold you here. Mm. And that's what you did because your story speaks volumes. And as you said, you were traveling all through the country and with the Kings. I remember speaking with Yolanda King and oh my goodness, whew. That was, that was incredible. Hearing her father gave me goosebumps in the mm -hmm. newsroom. And I was like, what? And then, so it was about a few months after, I believe, unfortunately, she had lost her life. Um, she had a heart attack. And, and I, we were just talking about her mom, Coretta Scott, when she was mm -hmm. in the hospital. So I feel you on all of these levels. So the gift that you gave, the brokenness that you had, was the next step in the journey that you were going to take. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this journey. All right. So as I mentioned, you were the recipient of the prestigious Martin Luther King Jr. Living the Dream Award. You truly are living the dream and helping others and giving them hope. 
whether they are going to make it out of jail after they do their term or maybe if they're lifers, they still have hope. That's what you've been blessed to do for them. <laughs> you've also written books. Let's talk about these books because it's important. And we are going to post these up for those who are tuning in and watching. Um, we also have, including the award-winning Peace Behind the Wire. I love that, a nonviolent resolution which has been endorsed by the King family. That's huge. Yeah. I want to pause right here. Tell me about this book and why it was so important for the King family to put their endorsement on it. Um, I think that, I mean, the whole thing for me, I was in Philadelphia and I was um, doing a keynote at a conference and it was about prison work. My, I was working at Hayes. I just got into it. And afterwards, the, the host came up and it was coming up on MLK Day, the 25th anniversary. That was going to be um, 2011. And this was in December of 2010. And he challenged everybody, go back to your hometown and do something in honor of Dr. King on his birthday. And I was like, shoot, I love that. And mm -hmm. so um, I, I'm standing in the back and all of a sudden, boom, they put Dr. King's face on the screen. And I'm like, I had my idea. It, it was an idea. I think everybody gets them, but a lot of times people don't grab them. It's like, man, you just got your life-changing idea and you were not paying attention. Mm -hmm. I was paying attention. And it, and it was, man, we're going to do 40 days of nonviolence at Hayes in honor of Dr. King. We'll jump it off on his birthday. I was so fired up, Gail, that I had my taxi drivers in Philly and I had him take me to the Rocky statue, get out and take my picture in front of Rocky like this because it was to celebrate my idea. That's how big this idea was. So I get on the plane and I start scribbling down these notes, which become the seven steps, you know, to this program that brings these rival gangs together. And I got back to the prison and, um, and the warden was not excited about my plan. <laughs> and so he poured water on it, but he gave me a shot. He said, keep it in that dorm and I don't want to hear about it. But he gave me the right to do it. And I started preaching Dr. King. I was like, I just started teaching them about King and Gandhi and Mandela. And we started drilling down into what a real man is. And miracle happened. So when I wrote the book, Dr. King's all through it. And so I'm sure I had already become cool with Bernice, mm -hmm. but we ended up doing a joint book release together at the King Center. So Dr. Bernice, she was releasing one of her books. I was putting this one out, which I think was my fourth. And, um, and it was a beautiful thing. We did a book signing thing and really bonded. And I've, I've gotten to see her along the way a little bit. But, um, and then they said that, that they'd be happy to sell it in the King Center. And so, yeah, they, they sell it. The King yeah. It's, it's beautiful. I've gotten connected to Mr. Gandhi through his granddaughter, Ela, because I spoke at the Gandhi Global, uh, Global Peace Summit in Durban, South Africa. And that meant the world to me. I interviewed her and she had a, a message for the prisoners. And I was like, I'm connected to that man. And then Dr. King, of course, I've got to have that connection. And then Mr. Mandela, um, I'm a huge, I mean, he changed my life the way he did his time. And I teach a lot about him and I almost met him and he was too ill and I did a video for him and I was told he watched it and to tell him what the, what was the, his teachings were doing for prisoners in America. So those three families, I mean, that's the greatest honor of my life, really. That's amazing. And he's got, um, uh, uh, Dr. King's granddaughter, I happen to see on YouTube, little thing, she is a powerhouse. Oh, she got a message. I was like, oh my goodness, you know? <laughs> yeah. so I don't think both of you on the platform, just her walking out and just, you know, hand in hand. So you never know. Yeah. You know, speak it goes up into God's ears. You never know. Your latest book, The New Convict Code, bringing peace to the street from behind the wire, flips the script on prison reform and aims to shatter the school to prison pipeline. Now, what I want to especially shine on, because we have so much to cover, you recently partnered with the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice, I understand, to bring peace to over 1,000 incarcerated kids in Georgia detention centers and youth prisons. You know we have to hear about this. Yeah. Please. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, this is the great work, I think, at least to date, <laughs> the great work of my life. Um, I've been praying and practicing about this one. I think all of my time with the adult prisoners and working with the gangs and learning this thing called the convict code. The convict code is the way things work inside a prison. There's no handbook. 
there's nobody to teach you you learn it and it's just it, it's the rules of the game in a place where a bunch of angry men are having to live in the same place and it's it's tough and so i've taken that code and I've just tweaked it. I respect their code. And then I use that to start introducing principles that make sense if we tweak the code. And that is something I think that maybe hasn't been done before is talk to them in their language. Let them, anyway, that's a whole other thing. Um, but what I started realizing was there was this young group of inmates that were coming up, the, the next generation of kids. The first, it was the 90 babies. And they came out of the crack epidemic. And, but then it was the, these 2000 babies that have grown up in the age of media in their hands. And I'm telling you, Gail, they're, they're unpredictable. They're impulsive. You know, their frontal lobes are not even half developed. Mm -hmm. And like you're saying, they're getting targeted at seven and jumped in at even 10, 11, 12. They're little soldiers. And now they're even shooters because they can shoot up a house. And if they get arrested, they'll go to juvenile and do four or five years instead of the big guy doing a life center. And so it's a dangerous trend of what's going on and, and we're building more and more prisons and filling them up. And so um, I just basically had to make a decision. I love working in the adult prison, but I thought, man, one life to live, what's the biggest impact I can make? And it's that, that school to prison pipeline. We got to keep kids off these streets, in school, out of the gangs, because the gangs are being much more effective than the churches and the schools and the you know, YMCA's and PTA's, the gangs are effective at getting our kids because we ain't giving them good choices. It's like, you know, so anyway, the I served on a House of Representatives um, study committee on youth gangs, and I was the, the civilian in the panel of politicians, and the one that was always sitting by me was the commissioner of the Department of Juvenile Justice. So he, I made friends with him, and he became very cool, and he read a couple books, and we put together this contract and he's got me down in his toughest facility. I mean, Gail, this is the toughest audience to date. They're 17 to 20 year old violent felons. Most of them are bloods. And then you got some Crips and GDs in there and they are just off the chain. And so he's brought me in to do what I told him, I believe will change things. And they're all in. I mean, they, they, this is the first time I've ever gotten support from my state. I, I just warm my way in, do it for free. And now they've finally embraced my work. And now it's a matter of me showing that these principles really do work. You are, are quite uh, an inspiration. And uh, for, for those who are joining in and listening, uh, please make yourself comfortable because you're getting quite the education here from my guest, Kit Cummings. He's an award-winning author, teacher, consultant, and he's joining me courtesy of Elite Public Image. And we are talking about how he is connecting the divide with the gangs. And we're talking also about the books that he has also written. And we're going to also see if we can talk about what eyes are on him about a potential project that will be coming to a TV near you. Is that safe to say? But I want to break down for you. Um, I've got some questions because as with gangs, some people probably don't realize when you say gangs, what does it mean? Who is it affecting? So let's break it down if we can, you and I. What are the five reasons you have learned that kids are joining gangs? Golly. I mean, we're living in a world where the the child and the adult, the, the gap is widening quick. It's, it's always been hard. Um, it's just the perfect storm. You've got, you know, both parents working full time or we've got single parent households. We've got kids that are raising kids and especially in our underserved areas. Um, there are just there's many, many needs and there's a lack of resources. And so these kids that are already living in tough areas man, first of all, they want to be safe. It's a dangerous world, especially in the tougher communities. And this, this kid's got to go to school. He's got to live in that neighborhood. So one is, man, I, I need to be safe. Okay, looking for safe. Um, many of our kids, white, black, and brown, are coming from some sort of broken family experience, whether it's divorce or maybe a single parent and never, want, you know, parent being involved. And so they're in desperate need of family. They, they need human connection, and especially from older males. Um, and so they're, they're craving that. 
they also just have basic needs. It's like, you know, I mean, I want cool shoes on my, I mean, they're going to school and you're wearing these dirty old kicks. That That is a source of bullying and shame. And if you're not wearing the right clothes and, and you've got kids that are, mm. and I, I want somebody to take care of that. And I got nobody that's helped me do that. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, many of them are having to be you know one of the coolest kids that i just i fell in love with this kid and i promise i'm gonna try to do something for him when he gets out um you know he started selling weed at 10 and he figured it out he's a smart kid mm. and he's he's about to get out after five years i mean he's a quarter of his young life he spent inside and it's because man he was the he was the man he had to support the family so he had to go make some money and so what are you gonna what are you gonna say to that? I mean, what's he gonna do? He's gonna do what he sees everybody doing. And so, you know, you, you put all that together. Man, I wanna feel safe. I need connection and family. I need some basic necessities, you know what I'm saying? And I want people that aren't gonna leave me yeah. because everybody has left them. It's like people that look like me, people that don't look like me, older people have promised them things and never showed up for them. And so look what the gang comes along and does. The gang says, hey, we're your fam. We will never leave you. Nobody will touch you. We'll put shoes on your feet, money in your pocket, groceries in your mother's refrigerator. We will kill for you. We will die for you. We're fam. And the church on the corner's not getting mm. that. They're not hearing that. You see what I'm saying? And so it's, it's not enough to say, just say no to gangs. You know, it's like nobody else is taking care of these kids. So, I mean, I did that. I hope I answered your question. Absolutely, because it sounds like what you do not have, it sounds like it gives this illusion or this sense of it is my right because I have others who are who are basically, it's like the addiction. You know, it, when you have that language, it's like, you know, um, from like from when I understand people who are suffering from the fact of if they didn't have it, it's my right to take it because... Mm -hmm. Okay. I want it too. Mm -hmm. I want it too. So I'm going to go this way to get it. So that's what it sounds like. Yeah. What about the age do gangs start recruiting? Mm. The, the most recent studies I've seen is by the age of seven, they have their eye on a kid mm. and they'll start taking a little extra care and putting a few mu uh, bucks in his pocket, looking out for him a little bit. And what they're doing is they're grooming him because they see talent and that means money. They're going to earn and so this kid, I mean, shoot, Gail, I, I proved as a guy that looks like me in an area that was not tough, that I was willing to do anything just to, to be, just to belong to whatever. If I was raised in a certain area of this town, you know, that happens to be red. I mean, what are you going to do if your parents wear red? Mm. and your neighbors and your brothers and all this kind of stuff and you're, it's families you, you know that's how many kids are being grown up in this world just like some kids are growing up christian because their parents are christian and they're being grown up they're athletes over here well these are gangs i mean now it's a generational thing whole little areas and neighborhoods and so they they get the eye on them start taking care of them grooming them jump them in put them to work and then mm. promote them and the kids, you know, I'm, that's who I'm working with. And it's fascinating. And I love them hard. But I tell you, it's a tough nut to crack this young generation. You got to be creative. Same old moves don't work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one last question of, of for the educational piece. Where are gangs most commonly found, Kit? I mean, traditionally, you're, it's always going to be in the inner city you know, where there's a lot of um, government housing, places where you're going to see apartment complexes. And now in the suburbs where there's apartment complexes, you have a lot of transit. See, you've got, you know, I mean, just all the things I named. But now, not just like in the, it used to be, you know, stay away from certain parts of town because that's a dangerous part of town. You know, it's, it's low income and it's, there's a lot of crime and violence. Now, you know, the gangs are, they're spreading out into the suburbs. They're going where the money is. And it's, it's drug sales and weapon sales, you know? And so, you know, where can you find them? Now, uh, they're, they're all over the place. I mean, it's business. 
And so most of the, the gun violence is in more of those traditional tough neighborhoods. But now we got kids bringing guns to school. They're recruiting in our schools. And we've got parents that their kids go to a pretty nice school. And I've even heard officers say, we don't have a gang problem at that school. And I'm like, I know for a fact you have a gang problem with that. It's, it's a dirty little secret. It's mm-hmm. operating underneath. But now they're starting to recruit a lot every year in our uh, in our high schools and kids that a lot of kids that would have just been athletes now are playing are athletes that are starting to play the game you know get their their hands over into the streets and so it's it's just you know we got to do something do you ever get afraid do you ever get have a fear when you go in um because with every generation there's a new new form or a new look if you will to the gangs there's one that maybe misses the radar and is not the same doesn't go by the same ethics and codes of maybe the other gang members have you ever encountered them and how did that ever turn out for you did you ever find that they would recognize you and just maybe go against the grain maybe they just felt like you know they were hard to get along with and helped understand what you were there to actually do was to help them yeah have you ever had that threatened to you yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, basically, if you mess with their money and you then you become a threat, <laughs> you know, it's like they're not going to like, but mess with their money. The cool thing with my deal is I bring I put down the violence. They do. But I just help them learn to put down the violence. And I don't say it, but hey, business goes a lot better where there's no violence mm-hmm. and there's going to be drugs in prison. Why not settle everything down? let them do what they're going to do but the officers are not i mean there's a lot to it but sometimes you know i mean there's especially with these younger ones they're very unpredictable i mean with in the juvenile prison i'm working with um this was so encouraging because it was just last week but you know one of the little gang leaders he got sideways with me about something i still don't know what it was and he threatened me i mean it was just a it was a bold threat you know don't come into my dorm you know or blah 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 mm-hmm. and so i was like all right and I respect it. I said, I respect. And then I didn't, you know, I mean, I, I, I do my thing up in another part of the building. And I was like, cool, you don't want me in there? All right. Because he's kind of running things. Mm. So I talked to the warden and I said, um, let's just let them do their thing. And I'll work with the other three dorms. And when good things start happening for the other three dorms, he'll probably figure it out. And he'll come back to the table. And, um, and that dorm has been off the chain. And the other dorms were making real progress. And they're starting to get some good stuff because we're trying to do incentive reward over punishment. They need hygiene products. I'm providing. They need socks. We're providing, you know, but they got to earn it, right? Put in good work. And so sure enough, last week, that kid comes marching into the room with all his guys, 13 of them, they sit down in the round table. And I'm like, what did you come back for? He said, because we were not represented last week when the commissioner came to talk to us. And I was like, well, you ain't been coming. And, uh, and he goes, we want to be blah, blah, blah. And so afterwards, I went up to him. I looked him in the eye. I said, me and you good? And he said, yeah, we're good. And it was just like, mm-hmm. I operate under this principle. And it's worked everywhere so far. I mean, mm-hmm. Honduran prisons are no joke. Working with cartel guys in Tijuana, no joke. Mm-hmm. And But I operate under this principle. Everybody knows that it's not right to touch a guy who's coming to help you, especially like a holy man. It's kind of the way they, especially in foreign cultures maybe the the hispanic gangs are very challenging um but you win them and they're gold but but i know in their culture you don't touch a holy man and if you do there's big trouble for you and and i operate under that principle that if anybody ever tried to hurt me they would get really really hurt and that's what's happened over the the years if somebody ever you know some guy got well i won't tell you that somebody Mm -hmm. you know they deal with their own and i'm one of them and so anyway, that's how I operate. And I also operate, I believe this on my heart. If you treat a man with sincere respect, and I know how to do that, and not just when it works. I mean, I really, really try to treat everybody with the same respect. And the lower, the more less than, let's say the death row inmate, who I fall in love with. Some, I've got friends on death row. Um, they get the most respect from me. Because Jesus said, however you treat the least of these, how you treat me. Well, I figured they're the least of the least of the least. Mm -hmm. So, you know, MS-13 is known that they don't do programs and they won't work with anybody. Well, they worked with me in Ellsworth, Kansas. And it's because I went to the leader correctly. And I said, I know you're a man of power. And I respect that. Mm -hmm. And I 
Do me the honor of your presence in my program. I need your help. I know who you are and I cannot do this without you. Mm -hmm. And he brought all of his brothers and he sat down uh -huh. and he was chosen to speak at the graduation and he delivered a powerful message on Mandela. And so that has worked for me. And if it doesn't work one day, then okay. <laughs> but <laughs> so far, so good. This is why I understand the rumor and I'm not a rumor girl, I'm a fact girl. So I hope you're gonna help me clear the fact of this rumor <laughs> uh -oh. that you are, are, your life is going to be visualized on some said uh, network perhaps. <laughs> Am I understanding this correctly? I mean, I don't wanna speak out of terms because I wanna, <laughs> you know? It, I'm so it's proud a very strange thing. It, yes, I, I guess what I'm allowed to say because I asked, what can yeah. I say? Because you got me. You know, that's right. why I'm like, mm -hmm. I know you, you I understand know. the bit. <laughs> <laughs> you understand it. I don't. I'm learning it. I do know how it is. But anyway, yeah, I'm under contract with a production company in LA um, for a film project. And it's going to be a dramatic film. Most likely, you know, what they want to do is, is make a, um, a limited series. You know, it'd be dramatic, limited series. And really, it's the, I can say, you know, it's about the story of the drunken fallen preacher that comes back to God through a bunch of gangsters and convicts in the least of these. And it's, you know, it's redemption. I mean, because people love true crime. We're watching a true crime, you know, thing right now oh, yes. about it. And because and everybody wants to see this world, this dark world. But rarely, if ever, is there light and hope and redemption at the end of it. And so, you know, maybe I said too much, but it's going to be about that. I want to give hope to the world. And I don't want to make another, I don't want to make a religious film. Because my story is not religious. You know, it's this crazy God that just mm -hmm. chased me around the world. I mean, he's, he's amazing. I want them to know him. Mm -hmm. So you can pray about it. But I, but I just went under contract, so I'm getting ready to learn a lot about it, I guess. That's awesome. And I'm so proud of you. And you know something? It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's what you have as a relationship and your relationship with others that has now produced what you hear in the stories that we are just so proud of you of. And of course, I'm going to keep you in my prayers. Kit Cummings is award-winning author, teacher, consultant, and you have to make sure that you join me on Gail Scott Key's Entertainment Now. Check it out on Facebook. And before I let you go, please give a shout out to all the social media platforms to which all of the listeners and viewers can view you and keep in touch. Where can we Absolutely. check you out? Um, KitCummings.com and PowerOfPeaceProject.com. Power of Peace Project. That's our work with kids. Um, but yeah, Kit Cummings on Facebook, uh, Kit Cummings 88 or on Instagram, and uh, Peace 88 on Twitter. Yeah, but I would love to and just meet my name on, on LinkedIn. But yeah, I mean, I'm reach out. We, we, we all need to be together on this one. It's about our kids. And I just want to say thank you so much. You, you've been very kind. I appreciate that. It is my honor. And that just means you have to come back on my show because when we talk about that, you know. Yes. Show, yes. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> That's a deal. I promise. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kit, thank you for everything that you do. Our prayers are with you. And I cannot wait to hear about how more things are going to be opening up. And to those kids who are listening, please, please, please make sure that you're having these conversations. And this is a wonderful way for you to get in contact. I'm going to post everything up on my Facebook page. Don't let anything keep you from the education of understanding what's going on. And parents, make sure that you are following Kit Cummings. This is a great honor to have him on my show. We are going to be continuing our dialogue with him. This will not, this will be one of many continuations of him coming on the show. But I want to make sure that you understand with everything that's going on, we wish you peace, connection. Being unified. Keep your kids close. Thank you.